Okay, so thank you very much, Merle, for the invitation to this very interesting workshop. And so my talk today is called Two Roads to Creating Social Cohesion, Conversational Alignment, and Motoric Entrainment. Okay, so I'm going to ground this talk in the evolutionary paradox of human cooperation. So according to traditional Darwinian theory, all organisms are selfish, they're trying to maximize their reproduction, spread their genes. And so cooperation is very difficult to explain in terms of standard Darwinian accounts. And yet we know there are many species that live in groups and that show a lot of cooperation. And so various theories have been put forward to explain this phenomenon of cooperation, one of which is kin selection, the idea that individuals are indeed selfish, but they will um, help and cooperate with uh, people with whom they share genetic relatedness. And so this is definitely a, an important process for human cooperation, uh, but it can't account for the fact that we have cooperation with non-kin on a very large scale in human societies. So another idea is called reciprocity, the idea that I'm going to help you, and then you're going to help me in the future, and there will be all these, these cycles of us helping each other through uh, these cycles of reciprocity. And of course, this is a very important force of human cooperation, but it's fairly limited to dyads and it's very difficult to scale up reciprocity to 10 people or 100 people. So it, it's very good for, for dyadic cooperation, but it doesn't scale up very well to the, the scale of cooperation that we see in human societies. So the third idea that I'm gonna mention here, which is perhaps the most controversial, is called group selection. And this does apply to cooperation at the level of large social groups. And there are many forms of this theory, but one that's very prominent at the time is that the biggest innovation in the evolution of human cooperation is the emergence of our capacity for culture. And once we evolve the capacity for culture, it's pretty straightforward to de develop uh, norms and rules that are going to incentivize cooperation, as well as having punishment mechanisms that are going to discourage um, cooperation. So I think all of these mechanisms are definitely operative and are contributing to human cooperation, including the cultural ones that I mentioned. But I want to go beyond that and talk about potential social bonding mechanisms that are very important in motivating cooperation beyond simply codes of conduct and social norms, that we have these social bonding mechanisms that motivate people to not just bond together, but to cooperate with one another. And so I'm gonna talk about what I see as being the two major ones. I'm gonna call this a dual cohesion model and talk about these two major bonding mechanisms as being conversational alignment and motoric entrainment. And to start the talk, I'm gonna make this a very dichotomous uh, comparison and make these seem very different. But throughout the talk, you're gonna see how these two uh, mechanisms are going to interact. But for now, I'm gonna show a very dichotomous view of conversation versus dance and the two bonding mechanisms that I'm showing here of alignment versus entrainment. So I'm gonna kind of frame this as kind of a mind-body uh, dichotomy, but again, I'm gonna bring these two together throughout the talk. So the first one about conversational alignment is much more cognitive and involves the exchange of ideas uh, using human-specific uh, <clears throat> processes for, for language, uh, discourse, and stance-taking. From a performative standpoint, this, this proceeds through a process of alternation, the famous turn-taking that occurs uh, during conversation. And from a rhythmic standpoint, these, these rhythms are very irregular, they're non-metric. This stands in contrast to the other mechanism of entrainment for which dance will be the prototype in this talk. This is much more the domain of physical actions, including what we've talked about at the conference so far, uh, cooperative joint actions. Um, what's important from a performative standpoint is that the partners are engaging uh, with each other in a simultaneous fashion rather than the exchange mechanism that we see in conversation. And not always the case, but at its best, this involves metric rhythms permitting synchrony among the, the various uh, performance uh, interaction partners um, in these uh, activities. And so again, I'm gonna start in a very dichotomous way, make this <clears throat> kind of a mind-body duality, but I'm, then, I'm gonna show how these two things interact. So I'll start here with this uh, cognitive alignment versus more corporeal uh, body entrainment, and then kind of work my way to unite these things. So I'll start with the first of the two mechanisms, um, conversational alignment. And so the operative mechanism here is what's referred to as stance taking. This is taken from the literature on conversation analysis. 
And there are different kinds of stance that we take during conversation. Uh, two of the most important ones are shown here. So epistemic stance versus affective stance. In epistemic stance, speakers demonstrate their level of knowledge or ignorance about a topic using phrases like, oh, I, I know that, or I don't get what you're talking about. So your level of knowledge or ignorance about a topic. But I really wanna focus on the process of affective stance in which speakers demonstrate their um, emotional appraisals of the topics being discussed. And so this is uh, demonstrated very nicely in the work of John Dubois as being a triangle. So this is the famous, the stance triangle and so two of the points of the triangle are, are two speakers, speaker one and speaker two. And the third point is that thing that they're talking about. So it could be an idea, it could be an object, it could be whatever, but this creates a triad between you have two speakers and then this third thing, which is the, the focus of their conversation. And during the course of the conversation, each of the speakers um, presents his or her affective stance towards the object. This is what happens during the conversation. People present their emotional appraisals of the topic, the object uh, under discussion. If their stances are close and convergent, we say that the people are aligned. If their stances are very different, they have a disagreement, the, an argument, whatever. The term that's used in the field actually is not the common English term misaligned, but they actually use the term people are disaligned. So alignment occurs when people's affective stances towards some third thing are very close. And we know that, that alignment is a very important building block <clears throat> of building bridges, as Morel would say, building social cohesion in human societies. And so that we know that we feel much closer to people if they share our aesthetic tastes or our personal interests, or most notably, if they share our social values. And this is not just about dyads, but the way that we can build bonds or feel, feel connected with larger scale social entities like groups, institutions, movements, and the like. And this is a mechanism for building um, consensus at a very large scale, not just dyads or small groups, but society as a whole as reflected in phenomena like or things like re religious discourse and political discourse. And so I'll just give an example that's, that's currently in the, in the news. The, the never ending American election. And so the US is a country where people who are aligned with conservative viewpoints and people who are aligned with liberal viewpoints are pretty much split 50-50. I mean, it's an even split. And so you take any given political topic, half the people are, are opposed, half the people are in favor. And a 50-50 split is a very <clears throat> unstable arrangement for any kind of social group or society. If you look at Canada, where I live, by contrast, the split is actually much closer to being 70-30. As it turns out, the 70s, the liberal side, I think that's not important, but there's much more uh, consensus, there's like 70, 30, there's much more alignment uh, among people and much more of a sense of social cohesion. As a result, Canada is considered to be a much more stable society um, than the US. So one thing that we know that will be discussed, I'm sure quite a bit at this, this conference is that when people are aligned, but not when they're disaligned, they show a convergence of several features of their, of their body. And uh, this will be discussed, I think, by, by several speakers at this conference. So the convergence, again, if people are aligned at the cognitive level, this kind of carries over to their, to their body interactions. And this is shown at many levels. So convergence of vocal prosody, facial expression, mutual gaze, posture, uh, body sway, people, people sway together. And even cognitive things like their lexical selections and even things like syntactic constructions. So when, when people are aligned at this more cognitive level, this seems to carry over to a physical convergence at the level of their, their voice, their face, and their body. More than that, the very process of having a conversation is a process of mutual entrainment. So we know there's this very seamless process of turn-taking that occurs during human conversation. So this is a process of mutual entrainment, just like uh, people doing finger tapping experiments or dancing. It happens to involve the voice as the effector compared to the body, but this is definitely a process of mutual entrainment <clears throat> that occurs during conversation. And so with this background, I can kind of pose the question to everyone. Um, is conversation a form of dance? And I've thought about this for a long time. It seems like a very enticing kind of idea. And I kind of lean on the side of the disanalogies more than the commonalities. And so let me point out what I see as being important differences between conversation and dance. Um, 
this kind of thing, this kind of body sway, all this convergence is for the most part quite unconscious. It's not intentional. And that's very different than in dance. In dance, people are very explicit. They're, they, they, they have joint movement goals. They're, they, they're practicing their parts. And so it's very conscious, very explicit. The kind of joint body sway, the convergence of prosody for the most part is unconscious during conversation. In addition, the performance arrangement, as I mentioned, involves alternation. The rhythms are non-metric and the major effector is the voice. And so I wanna think about dance as being something different from conversation in this regard. So that brings me to the second mechanism in this dual cohesion model of uh, motor entrainment. And so group dancing is very much a human evolutionary novelty. There's really nothing like it anywhere else in nature. And group dancing is a great form of cooperative behavioral synchrony. Now, there are many other forms of behavioral synchrony in animals, but they're all competitive. So think about, you know, chirping of crickets and the mating calls of frogs. They're very synchronized, but they're done in a very competitive fashion. These are males competing for the interests of females. And so the synchrony is kind of like a, a pseudo kind of synchrony that's just allowing each animal to kind of jam the acoustic signal of other males. It's not cooperative at all, but group dancing is something that's, that's very cooperative. And I was very happy to see Meng Sen's video where she showed the salsa rueda. Actually, I spent many, many years learning how to dance uh, Cuban salsa. It's one of the most beautiful art forms that exists anywhere in any culture. And so I was very happy to see the video of that. I'm going to show you a different video. I'm going to show you um, a flash mob that occurred during an episode of the Oprah Winfrey show. And it's quite astounding because you're going to see that this is a flash mob that involves 20,000 people. So 20,000 people moving in synchrony during this flash mob. So I'm going to play the video. You're gonna see this very amazing um, act of synchronization in, in humans, 20,000 people synchronized in their dance movements. Say hello to the black eyed Let's live it up, I got my money. Hey. Let's spend it up, let's spend it up. Go on and smash it, smash it. Let go my car, let go my car. Come on, let's get it on. Oh. Fill up my club train. Yes, Oprah, it's, it's very, very cool. And it's definitely totally unique in nature. There's no other species that does anything even remotely similar uh, to this. And so I've talked about the features of conversation and alignment. I wanna switch gears and now talk about dance. As I said, by comparison to conversation, this is now something very corporeal, something physical that occurs during cooperative joint actions. And what's very important now is that the interactants now they're engaging simultaneously in this behavior. And in the best case, like we just saw with this flash mob, everyone is doing this according in a, in a beat-based fashion to a metric rhythm. They're all synchronized in time. Now, of course, this is not just about the body. They're also vocal counterparts. We just heard the black eyed peas. And so musical chorusing is one vocal counterpart. There's also synchronous speech that occurs at political rallies. And so they're definitely vocal versions of this kind of, of synchrony um, beyond just the, the body and, and forms of dance. And so one thing that will be talked about, I'm sure quite a bit at this conference is that synchronizing with people leads to a whole slew of pro-social consequences, including an increase of trust, liking, people feel more connected with each other after synchronizing. Uh, people are much more likely to help others and cooperate with others 
after having undergone this kind of behavioral synchrony. Uh, people feel more connected, not just with individuals, but with institutions, with groups. Um, and having done this my whole life, we all know this is very pleasurable. It's a very pleasurable activity. And so my take on this from an evolutionary standpoint, this is not just about you know, relaxation or entertainment or diversion, but to me, from an evolutionary standpoint, this is a short-term intervention that produces a long-term benefit. So across human societies, people engage in these synchronous uh, behavioral rituals. They dance together, they sing together during circumscribed uh, rituals because this has a long-term benefit on, on the society at large, their willingness to cooperate, the solidarity of the group. And so it's like you know, a little bit of a, a shot of medicine. It's an intervention that has short in the short term that leads to a long-term benefit to increase cohesion, solidify the group, and ensure the stability of, of these very unstable things that we call social groups. Um, so while entrainment itself is not the same thing as alignment, I do think that it does provide one of the foundations for alignment, especially at the large group level. But I just wanna point out one more thing um, that was kind of mentioned in the last talk. So uh, Merle works on this topic um, of entrainment. And so when this is discussed, it's only ever discussed as being relative timing. We've seen that in the, all the talks already that, I, that I've been to, relative timing. So people talk about you know, cross correlations and, and asynchronies. What's really never mentioned, and I think it's really critical to this phenomenon of entrainment, is the mentalizing component. The fact that uh, when you're in training with someone during a joint action, you're constantly thinking about um, their intentions, you're thinking about the joint goals, how you're going to instantiate the joint goals. And so with this active process, this ongoing process of mentalizing, even when you're doing something very non-cognitive, like a motoric task. And so I just wanna look at the brain, just one slide about the brain, but here's a study, a recent study by Abi and colleagues, neurocorrelates of online cooperation during joint force production. It's a hyper-scanning fMRI study. Two people are placed in two separate scanners and they have to undergo, they're, they're doing a forced production task. They, they grip these, these forced transducers and they either do the task alone or they do it where they have to uh, align their force with their um, interaction partner. And so the question is, what parts of the brain are more active when people do this with a partner compared to when they do this alone? And here are the results of the partner versus solo contrast. What we see is huge activations increases in parts of the brain like the temporoparietal junction and precuneus that are parts of the mentalizing network. And again, nothing about this task was, was about, you know, thinking about people's beliefs or ideas. It wasn't a mentalizing task. It was simply a joint force production task. But the, the critical thing that occurs during partnered interaction compared to solo is big increases in parts of the brain that are involved in mentalizing, especially mutual mentalizing uh, between partners. And so I'm almost out of time here. And so to conclude, I grounded this talk in the evolutionary paradox of human cooperation. It really is a big paradox for people who study human evolution. I talked about theories uh, that try to explain this in terms of kinship, in terms of reciprocity, um, culture, and different codes that incentivize cooperation, punishment to disincentivize it. But I also wanna talk about how these social bonding mechanisms that I discussed are really critical uh, bases for um, cooperation. So these social cohesion mechanisms of conversational alignment and motoric entrainment. I kind of presented this very dichotomous view initially of you know, one, like the mind system versus the body system. But I kind of, I weave the story here um, in which these two things are very interactive in the end that when you align, you have all these kind of body sequelae of convergence. And when you entrain, there seems to be poorly understood, but processes of ongoing mentalizing when you do uh, motoric entrainment with people. That's my talk. And I just have um, my web link here, NeuroArts. We can have a conversation. We can be aligned or disaligned. I don't, I don't really care, but let's have a conversation about, about these topics. So thank, thank you. you so much, Steve. And <laughs> is it Steve or Steve? I asked that because I, I, I think sometimes you signed off with one and sometimes with the other. Is it? No, I think I always sign it as Steve. And people call me Steve anyway, so I, yeah, I'm not I'm offended. I'm going to call you Steven then because I prefer <laughs> to give you the right. <laughs> Uh, first of all, yeah. thank you so much for your talk, and mainly because it is very hard to get people to come and talk about dancing, amazingly enough. 
And yeah. there's such a there's such a sad divide between people who work more on models of of musical interaction and and those yep. working more in the dance field, which I find is really a, a, a big problem because of exactly the your your, your nice little uh, uh, duality uh, dual uh, cohesion model because it's a really great example where you have to definitely do a lot of the alignment and a lot of the entrainment. It's definitely yep. not a pure case of one or the other. Um, and I, I think the flash mob is great, but I mean. Uh, obviously, if one thinks of all the dance that we're not able to go and watch live at the moment, which is another tragedy of the COVID pandemic, um, it, you will see incredible examples, both within dyads, but in larger, uh, called the Valley, where you see these incredible uh, feats of precision, which although flash mobs are always quite astounding. Uh, I, I miss the, the slightly smaller scale uh, group interactions that I think Ming Sen was uh, talking about today. Can I just comment on one? Can I just make yes. one comment? What yes, I like please. about studying, what I like about studying dance, is you get you get music for the same price. You don't lose music when you when you look at music alone. You definitely lose a lot of the physicality. The you lose the dance. If you're if you're studying dance as part of your research program, you are getting music for the same price because music is an integral part of dance. And so you're looking at music is one cue you entrain to your partners or other cues that you entrain to. So you get this this very multi sensory polymodal kind of thing. So. I don't think you have to choose between music and dance because if you're looking at dance, you're getting all the music for the same price and all the, the cueing that comes from musical rhythm, melodic contour. So I think it's like, it's, it's the best bang for your buck. You're getting a, a much more holistic package than looking just at music on its own, is my feeling Absolutely, about that. which is why we will be having to have a lot more talks because I'm moving into that uh, domain after missing ballet for so many years. I now need a way to, to talk about dance more. So I just start small with finger tapping, but I, I'm, I'm getting there slowly. Um, I do have a question for you from Liam Cross, uh, who says, thank you for the great talk. Um, you mentioned cooperative coordination and synchrony as being a human novelty. What about things like flocking or herding, which seem at least partially non-competitive? Would you say yeah, that really makes really them different? That's great. Thank you for that question. Because I think if, if we, that's why I listed rhythm in my, in my comparison. So I had non-metric rhythms versus metric rhythms. And so if we look at mutual entrainment at the non-metric level, it's abundant in nature. So just like the question said, um, herding, flocking, flying. So at the non-metric level, we see mutual entrainment of you know, migrational movements, large scale, but this metrically timed beat-based beat thing, we don't see, as far as I know, is not common outside of, of human. That's why I listed the metric regard. So dance really takes us into the special domain of we're synchronizing metrically. Um, but no, definitely the, the non-metric form of mutual entrainment uh, for migrations and uh, birds flocking. Oh yeah, wide, wide, widespread. So yeah, so the dance is a little bit different in the sense that it's doing that, but doing it in a much more metrically timed uh, beat-based fashion. So yeah, no, I definitely support uh, that. No, we will be we will definitely be talking because I'm uh, currently writing a paper with uh, Hila Kurt and we are going to be talking exactly on the distinction between those two uh, rhythmical uh, types and why humans seem a bit special with their uh, metrical abilities um, oh. comparing that to basic herding phenomena. So by the way, I mean, people talk about the evolution of rhythm. It's always about music. The evolution of rhythm for me is all about dance. And so I have a whole sort of like, you know, group dancing theory for the origins of rhythm. And so I take it outside of completely the domain of, of music, put it where it belongs in this mutual entrainment between, between dancers. And so I think that's, I think we need a sort of a paradigm shift. Everything is about musical rhythm, but I think the origins of our sense of, of metric entrainment comes from dance and not, and not I, think, I think music inherited something that evolved in the context of group dancing. That, that's definitely my, my, my take on it. So. Well, I mean, if you think about, you know, where it begins, babies bouncing, if we think of Tomasello's, uh, Kirchner's group, uh, Kirchner's work in his group, um, you know, kitties moving in time, right, is, is where it all begins and, and it basically never ends. And even, you know, those, those, all the way up to those flash mobs that you showed us. So I, I would have to agree. I suppose the issue is that it's so much harder and, and that's basically the, the wall I've hit is it's so much harder to create really good controlled uh, dance studies. So uh, we, we definitely need this paradigm shift, but it, it comes with a lot of, uh, a lot of challenges. Um, but that's why we're here. That's, go ahead, that's, sorry. That, that, that's why we're here. That's why you're organizing these fascinating conferences because we have to move beyond finger tapping for sure and, and look at whole body movements and think about dance and not just music. And so the, the field has to kind of move in the direction of, of things that are more ecologically valid than just finger tapping. It's, it's, 
my feeling. But on that note, I'm going to mention our creative coordination uh, workshop on Friday. Uh, and we saw Early. a version of the mirror game in Wayne's talk just before yours. We are going to do a live mirror game over Zoom and you are all invited to, to watch how disastrous it is with the technological lag. Um, but I just want to thank you, Stephen, for your time, you. for your talk and for telling us how important dance is.